What is going on guys, welcome back. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can train a machine learning model to predict laptop prices. So let us get right into it. All right, so in this video today, we're going to use a Kaggle data set called Laptop Price. You will find a link in the description down below where you can download this data set. All you have to do is you have to log into Kaggle and click on this button up here. Uh, then you're going to download the archive.zip file and inside of that archive.zip file you will find this laptop underscore price.csv file which is the actual data set. Now we're going to look close into the data set here in a second but let's just get a quick overview here. So here you can see the features that are part of this data set and down here you can see a little preview. You can see that we have an ID identifying the individual laptops. We have information about the company, the model, RAM, GPU, CPU, all that stuff. And then of course we have our target variable, which is the price of the actual laptop, the thing that we want to predict with our machine learning models. And one thing that is interesting about this data set is it contains a lot of information, but a lot of the information needs to first be pre-processed uh, or extracted. So for example, you can see here we have company name, we have product name or model name, you could say. Uh, we have the type. All of these are features that we cannot just use and feed into a model, into a random forest regressor, into a neural network. We have to do something with them. We have to encode them in some way before we can use them. But this is not only true for categorical features or brand names. This is also true for uh, actually numerical features. So for example, we have here the screen resolution but it's part of a string. So we don't just have the width and the height, we have a string that uh, tells us about the type of display um, and about the resolution of the display. And we also see here that for the CPU, we have the information mixed together. So we have the brand, we have the model name, we have the frequency as, uh, which are actually three separate features as one feature, as one string feature. Uh, same goes for the RAM here, we have um, a string with the gigabytes, we have here uh, for the hard disk what type it is and the memory in uh, one feature mixed together. So we will need to do some pre-processing of this data set before we can properly train a machine learning model on it. And this is why I chose it for the video today because uh, I'm going to show you here the process of pre-processing a data set and then using it for machine learning and the model that we're going to end up with uh, will actually be kind of accurate. Now it's not going to give you the exact price, it's not going to always give reasonable responses, but it will be better than just guessing uh, without having information. So we're going to go through that here. I have the code already prepared, which is why I'm going to occasionally look at my second screen here. But what I'm going to do now is in the same directory where I have the data set, I'm going to start a new Jupyter notebook, a new IPython notebook, uh, and I'm going to start by importing pandas. Now, for this video, you should have the basic Python data science stack installed. You should have pandas, numpy, matplotlib, seaborn, scikit-learn, uh, all the basic uh, machine learning data science libraries. And this video is also not for complete beginners. Now you can still watch this as a complete beginner to just see what happens here. But if you don't understand basic stuff like uh, scaling, if you don't understand what a random forest regressor is or how to train a model, what a train test split is, this is not the starting video for you. This is more an application of machine learning knowledge that has already been covered on this channel. So you can still watch this as a beginner, but this is more an intermediate tutorial. So what we're going to do here, if we don't have these libraries installed, is we're going to open up the command line. We're going to type pip install. And here you type now numpy pandas matplotlib seaborn and scikit-learn. I think that's all. I'm not sure if we're going to use any other libraries. Otherwise, we have to install them as well. Uh, run that command, then you're going to install all these dependencies, and then you can start with the coding. So we're going to import pandas as pd. Let me just zoom in a little bit here. Uh, we're going to import pandas as pd. And we're going to just load now this CSV file into our notebook. So we're going to say here that the data is going to be, or let's call this DF for data frame. The DF is going to be PD read CSV laptop underscore price CSV. And then we can just, uh, of course, there is a, an error. So we need to probably provide uh, an encoding. Encoding equals, what's the problem here? UTF-8 cannot encode it or decode it. So let's say Latin 1. Does this work? Seems to work. There you go. 
So this is now our data set. Um, I think it's printing all the columns. Is it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13? Yes. Um, so we have all the columns and we have here uh, the various different features. Now, looking at this, you can already see we can only use two features right out of the uh, right out of the box, which is the inches because this is just a float. Uh, and the target variable, which is just also a float the actual price of the laptop. All the other features cannot be used as they are right now, we need to pre process them. But before we do that, some of the features we're going to entirely drop because it just doesn't make sense to in any way encode them, at least for this video, I don't want to do it. Um, and one such example would be the product name. So encoding the company might make sense because Apple computers might be more expensive than some other brands like Acer, for example. Um, but going into every single product, I don't feel like that's reasonable, especially if we look here at df product dot value counts. We're going to see probably this is just an assumption. Uh, yeah, we have quite a lot of them. So we have 618 different product names, which means that if we were to one hot encode this uh, as a categorical feature, this would just produce problems because we would have 618 features. Uh, this would add a lot of noise and a lot of them only occur once. So it doesn't really make sense to use that feature for me. Uh, we are going to use a company though, because I think there are not too many companies we have. Um, I want to count them now, but we don't have too many companies. So we're going to use that here. And we're going to drop unimportant features anyways, later on. So we're going to look at the correlations and we're going to drop unimportant features uh, anyways. But this is what we're going to um, this is what we're going to include, we're going to drop the product name, uh, we're going to use the type name because that should also not have too many different values. So type name has only a couple only six different uh, values that it can have. So this is a perfect categorical feature. Um, inches, we're going to use just like that screen resolution, we're going to have to extract the actual uh, resolution, I'm not gonna pay attention to the actual type of the display. Now, this could make sense. So for example, we could create a feature uh, is the keyword IPS in uh, inside of the screen resolution string. And then we could say IPS, yes, IPS, no. And if you want, you can try to do that. Here's an exercise and you could see if you can improve the model. But I'm going to entirely focus on the screen resolution, we're going to extract the actual resolution, the actual width and height of the screen. Uh, for the CPU, we're going to extract only the brand and the frequency, I'm not going to go into all the models into all the different models that we have here. Um, and for the RAM, we're going to just remove the gigabytes, I think all of the RAM should be gigabytes. So if I say, uh, how is it written capital R value counts? Yeah, all of those are in GB. So we're just going to remove that string and turn it into an integer that shouldn't be too difficult. Um, for the hard disk memory, what we're going to do is we're going to extract a type. So is it SSD? Is it flash? Is it HDD? And also um, the size. So we're going to have to extract this and also take care of uh, gigabytes and terabytes because here, for example, that one terabyte is more than those 256 gigabytes. So we are going to have to take this into account. Um, for the GPU, we're just going to focus on the brand, I don't want to go into all these models again, because we would have too many features, the operating system, we're going to encode as a category, the weights, uh, we're going to just remove the kilograms, and we're going to turn it into a float. And then we have a data set that we can actually use. So we're going to start with the pre processing. The first thing is we're going to drop a couple of things. Or actually, we're going to only drop product because for the other features, we're going to drop only part of the feature. So we're going to say df equals df drop. And we're going to drop uh, product axis one, because we want to drop a column. And now if I print df, you can see that product is no longer in here. So let's start by encoding the company and the type name, all we want to do here is we want to take this feature company, which is uh, which has different strings in it. And we want to say each different string is a category and I want to have a binary feature. So we, we don't want to have company Apple HP Lenovo, we want to have Apple 001, Lenovo 001, HP 001. So all of these brands are going to become their own feature. And they're going to have either zero or one as a value. So this is done by using 
uh, a function or a method from pandas called get dummy. So you can also do it with scikit-learn, but we're going to do it with pandas. It's easier and more compatible with the data frame. So what we want to do here is we want to say pd get underscore dummies. And then we pass here df.company. And this will result in that. Here we have now all these companies being either zero or one. So for each row, we only have one column being uh, being one, all the other ones being zero. So if it's an Apple computer, we're going to have a one here and zeros here. This is just a format that can be processed by um, by the machine learning models easily. Now, you might be asking now, why don't we use ordinal encoding? Why don't we just say Apple is one, Acer is two, uh, or in this case, Acer is zero, Apple is one, Asus is one, uh, Asus is two, sorry. Why don't we just say that those are on a scale? Why don't we just enumerate them? And the reason you don't want to do this with this kind, uh, kind of data here is because these values are not on a scale. If we have these values from zero to, uh, I don't know how many they are, but let's say uh, 12 or something, I don't know how many they are, but um, 19, there it says 19 columns. If we have them enumerated, enumerated from zero to 18 in this case, um, the model could assume that they lie on a scale. So you could say that if the company is uh, Asus, it's closer to Acer than to this one. Or if it's Google, it's closer to Apple than it is to uh, Toshiba, for example, which is not the case because those brands are not enumerated based on proximity. They're just categories. They're independent. Uh, so those two here are not closer together than those two. Now, looking at the letters, there might be, but when it comes to the concept of what is behind that company, this is not true. So we one hot encode them as binary features. Now, in order to take this and add this to the data frame, what we want to do is we just want to say df dot join. And we want to set this to df. And then we also want to say df equals df drop. And we want to drop the company feature axis one. And then you have the following data frame. First of all, you don't have the company anymore. And then you have a bunch of columns. Not all of them are displayed here in the end. Uh, with the respective brands. So we're going to do the same thing now for uh, for the type name. So we're going to say here, get the type name, join it to the data frame and drop the type name. And then we're going to have this feature again, not in, uh, not here anymore. And in the end, you can see we have um, we have two in one convertible gaming netbook notebook ultrabook workstation. Uh, also again, binary encoded. So we have those two features. Now for the inches, we're going to keep them like that. They're just numerical values. Now for the screen resolution, we want to actually split on um, on spaces because what we want to have is we want to have this this string here. And when you look at these strings, you can notice one thing. Uh, and this is that the resolution is always the last thing in the string. So this is always at the end of the string. So it's very easy to extract a resolution because it's not somewhere we don't have to use regular expressions uh, to find something that has number x number, we can just take uh, the last word when we split on uh, spaces. So if I go ahead and say df dot screen resolution, Um, dot string dot split on white space, you can see that we always have this resolution as the last um, as the last entity here. And if I just go ahead and say negative one as an index here, uh, or probably I should say, apply lambda x, x negative one like this, you can see that we get the screen resolution. So that is going to be our screen resolution feature, but we're going to turn it here actually into uh, into screen width and screen height. So we're going to say screen width is going to be equal to DF screen resolution. So here we just replaced the feature. And now we're going to create a new feature. So we're going to say uh, take the string and split it on the x. And when you split it on the x, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to take the first number here for the width and 
the second one for the height. And then you can see now that when I scroll to the right, we have the respective values here and we can use them. So that's nice. We're also, also going to drop here um, the screen resolution feature axis equals one. So now we don't have this feature anymore. Uh, and then we also have here the CPU feature. Here we're also have, uh, we also have a fortunate situation that the structure is always the same. We always have um, the company name or the brand, then we have the model and then we have the frequency. So all we need to do here is we need to say that we want to take the CPU string, we want to split it on white spaces um, and then we want to apply a lambda expression where we take the first word in order to get the company and we take the last one, so negative one, in order to get the frequency. So this is what we want to do here and we're going to just say that this is the CPU brand and the CPU frequency. And then we can again drop the CPU feature. And then you can see in the end we have these two features. Now for the frequency, uh, we want to also get rid of the um, of of the gigahertz. So we only want to have um, we only want to have the number and what we're going to do for that is let me just um, see what I did. I think I just removed the last three letters because in this data set, we don't have any other structure than just having these three letters in the end. So removing those uh, is going to result in just a number. So we're going to say here that the CPU frequency is going to be equal to the CPU CPU frequency we're going to take the string and we're going to say up until the last three characters. And this is going to leave us with just the number without uh, the unit. Um, yeah, that's that. Uh, what else do we want to do here? Let me just see. Uh, the next thing that we have is the RAM. For the RAM, it's quite simple. We just want to remove here um, the gigabytes, we want to say here that the RAM is going to be whatever it is right now, we're going to take that as a string and we're going to say up until the last two characters. So now we have just the gigabytes as a number here. Um, probably it makes also sense. I'm not sure if this is done by default. If I say now DF histogram, uh, I don't think that it will plot the RAM because it doesn't recognize it as a numerical feature. And this is also true, I think, for the CPU frequency. So uh, I'm not sure if I even did that in my prepared code. But uh, we do have to typecast this into an integer uh, for it to be used by the model. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say DF RAM. And uh, I don't know what the function was. Was it as type? I think it was as type int. Does it work like that? Yeah, it works like that. So we're going to just say df ram equals ram as type int and then CPU frequency is CPU frequency as type float. This does not work because I mistyped frequency. And now let's see if that worked. At least we have the same values and now they should be integers and floats. Um, and probably want to do the same thing for the screen height and for the screen width. So let's just uh, copy this here. Screen width. Screen width and then screen height and screen height. There you go. So now if I plot a histogram, I think we should get all these features here as well. There you go. Um, because the histogram function only takes uh, positive, 
uh, not positive, uh, only numerical values or features. So for the memory, we're going to split again on the space. We're going to take uh, the first part um, of the string for, for the actual capacity, and we're going to take the second part uh, or the rest of the string because sometimes it's two words uh, or more words. Um, we're going to take that as the actual type. So we're going to say df memory amount is going to be equal. Uh, and what we want to do here, actually, maybe let's just do it like that. Yeah, let's say first memory string split on white space and take the first one by applying a lambda expression again. So that will be the memory amount. And then we have the memory uh, type, which is going to be the rest of the string. So actually one until the end uh, makes sense, I think, because we're otherwise going to just get flash, for example. I mean, flash is actually fine. Why not just go with flash? Let's just go with one because we don't need storage. So before we produce any problems, let's just see memory type value counts. Yeah, this works. All right, now for the memory amount, we're going to write a simple function to uh, take the string and turn it into a number, which is going to be uh, depending on gigabytes or terabytes. So we can actually go ahead and say df memory amount value counts so that we can see we have basically always just gigabyte or terabyte. We don't have anything else. So what we want to do is we want to define a function, turn the memory into uh, megabytes. So we want to have one unit um, and we're going to just pass the value here and we're going to say if the string gigabyte is in value, then we're going to return float the value up until the point where we find this gigabyte string. So basically just take the number, um, turn it into a float and multiply it by 1000 and elif if terabyte is in value, want to take the same thing. But this time for terabyte, and we want to multiply it by three more zeros. That's basically it. That's the function. We're going to apply this function now to memory amount with a lambda, actually not with a lambda expression, we can just pass the function here that turns all of this into megabytes and we can just store this back into memory amount. And then we can also drop the memory feature. So drop memory axis one. Uh, now we should not do this again. So let's just go down here. do that. Um, and now we don't have too much left. We have only the GPU, we have the operating system and we have the weight for the weight. Uh, for the weight, it's quite simple. We're just going to say weight equals weight, uh, or actually, let me just see here briefly the value counts if we have any structure that could be problematic. No, it's always kilograms. So we're going to just say that this is weight string uh, not even split just up until the last two characters. Uh, and probably we should then say also weight equals weight as type float. Let's see if that worked seems to work. Uh, and then we have these two features here, we're just going to ex uh, extract the GPU name or the GPU brand. So we're going to say DF GPU brand is going to be uh, whatever we get here from GPU. We're going to split this thing on white space, we're going to apply a lambda expression, where we get the value x and we take just the first split, uh, which is going to be the brand name. So of course, we need to say string split. And then we have at the end of this data frame, Intel, Intel, AMD, and probably also Nvidia. So we're going to then drop the GPU feature axis one. 
and then we have only the operating system, which we're going to easily just one hot encode. So df uh, dot join pandas get dummies df dot operating system. That looks like like this Mac OS, Windows, 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 no OS, Mac OS X, Chrome OS, Linux, Android, whatever. Um, we're going to take this now here into DF and then we're going to say DF drop and we want to drop um, want to drop the operating system feature. <clears throat> I want to store this back. So like this. There you go. And now we have features. Um, oh, we need to also one hot encode the GPU brand because otherwise we cannot use it. So let's just see here real quick. Um, did I actually do that in a prepared code? Yes. But for this one, we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to do some some more work because we need to also change the name of the features because the CPU can be from Intel uh, and the GPU can be from Intel. And the problem here is that uh, in this case, we want to have different column names because otherwise we would have two columns named Intel. And what we're going to do in order to prevent this is we're going to first of all, let me see, do we still have the CPU brand? as a column, because then we also need to Yeah, we also need to one hot encode this one. Uh, so we're going to have the CPU brand and the GPU brand um, encoded, but those can overlap because of Intel and AMD, they produce processors and uh, also uh, GPUs. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say uh, CPU underscore categories uh, is going to be PD get dummies, um, DF, CPU brand. And based on that, we're going to then say CPU categories, we're not going to take the default column names, but we're going to say columns equals and then we're going to do a list comprehension the column name that we have plus underscore CPU for column in CPU categories dot columns. And we're going to gen then say df equals df join CPU categories with the new column names, and then df equals df drop uh, the CPU brand column axis one. And then we now have at the end of our data frame, uh, these features AMD CPU, Intel CPU, Samsung CPU, and we're going to copy this now and we're going to do the same thing for the GPU. So we're just going to say G G, then G, 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 and I think that's the last one G. So we now have GPU categories, GPU brand GPU categories plus GPU GPU categories, there you go. And then we also have now NVIDIA GPU, Intel GPU, ARM GPU, AMD GPU, uh, and the CPUs here still. So I think that should be it. Let me just see what the columns are that we have right now. We have um, the brands, we have the types, we have the frequency, the amount of memory, we have the operating systems, we have CPUs and GPUs, I think that's it. And now what we can do is we can take these features and we can um, plot a correlation matrix. So you can just take the data frame and uh, call the core function for correlation. And you can see here how the individual features correlate. Now we don't really care about how the RAM correlates with um, the brand Apple necessarily, what we want to know is how do these features correlate with the price in euros. So this is what we want to predict. So we need a high correlation with this uh, feature here. And this is not necessarily a good overview. But what we can see here already is that the Nvidia GPU. So if the system has an Nvidia GPU seems to be highly correlated uh, with a higher price, makes sense, I guess. Um, but we can also visualize that here in a heat map by saying import Seaborn S S N S and then import matplotlib.pyplot SPLT. 
and then saying uh, SNS heat map this correlation matrix annotation equals true and then color map equals yellow, green, blue. And then maybe before that we want to say PLT figure figure size is going to be equal to 1815. Um, and I think this is not going to give us a good overview. There are just too many features. So we're not really going to see a lot. Um, there you go. But uh, if we reduce those features down to features with a decent correlation, when looking at the where is it price euros, um, feature here, we could get a better overview. So let's go ahead and say that we want to have um, the correlations only with the price. So we can say here, target correlations are equal to the correlation matrix, but only the column for the price euros. We want to apply here the absolute function. Why do we want to apply this function? Because it doesn't really matter if the correlation is um, negative or positive, it just should be a strong correlation. Because if a feature has a correlation of negative uh, 0, 09, that is a very relevant feature, even though it's inversely relevant. So it's, um, if this feature is high, the price is going to be low. And if the, uh, the feature is low, the price is going to be high, but it is a very relevant feature. So we want to sort here uh, by relevance, but we don't care if, if the feature is, um, if the correlation with that feature is positive or negative, we just want it to be high uh, or strong. So we're going to apply this absolute value function here, and then we're going to sort values um, and we can also display this now we can see that this feature here seems to be super relevant. So the brand, um, we can also see that having a Samsung CPU doesn't play a big role here. Um, but we can see that for example, the amount of RAM that a laptop has is super important for the price. Um, also, the screen size seems to be very important. Uh, whether it's a notebook, uh, notebook or not, the CPU frequency, all these things seem to be very important. So what we're going to do now is we're going to just select the top 20 features. So we're going to say selected features equal target correlations, negative 20 uh, until the end dot index. So we just want to have the feature names, we don't want to have the correlation values. And now we can say selected features equal a list of selected features, so that we don't have a panda series here. Uh, and then we can see those are the feature names. Now, of course, the price itself uh, will also be part of it. So maybe we should go with 21 to get the top 20. Um, and then we can see those are the features that are actually the most important features. Um, and we stop here, which is at 0 0.15, which is also a good threshold. So we could also say that we only include features that have a correlation of 0 0.15 or higher. Uh, being negative or positive 0 0.1.5. <clears throat> and with these features, now we can define a limited data frame, which only takes deselected columns. So this is then the data frame that we're going to use here, or that we can use here. Um, and uh, what we want to do now is we want to plot the correlation heat map again. So we're going to say SNS heat map limited data frame correlation annotation being equal to true, the color mat being yellow, green, blue. And before that want to say PLT figure, figure size is going to be equal to 1815. And then we get this nice correlation heat map here, um, with the price euros at the end. And we can see that here RAM has a very high positive correlation notebook has a very, t uh, a very uh, low, a very high negative correlation, sorry, uh, meaning that if it's a notebook, it tends to be cheaper. Uh, and then we have some other interesting values here as well. So the more dark blue the value is, the stronger it's positively correlated with uh, the price, the more uh, light yellow it gets, the more it's negatively correlated with the price and the more it goes into some turquoise, greenish, bluish, uh, science stuff, it's uh, less relevant. So that's the basic idea of this heat map here. Now, let's just take this data frame and train a simple model on it. 
And we're going to start with a random forest regressor, or my best guess is that the random forest regressor will perform the best uh, because of the structure of the data set and of the problem. Because the random forest uh, regressor works with decision trees and decision trees are um, something that is very intuitive in this particular task because we have this question, is it a Windows 7 um, system or not? Is it a Linux operating system or not? Does it have an AMD CPU or not? Uh, is it from Acer or not? Is it a gaming laptop or not? And stuff like that. So decision tree seems to be uh, a decision tree seems to be a good idea here. And a random forest is just many uh, decision trees combined into an ensemble so that we get some more um, so some better results here. So let's go ahead and say from sklearn. Let me zoom in here again from sklearn dot preprocessing. We're going to import the standard scalar because we always want to scale our data before we just uh, launch it through a model. Then we also want to say from sklearn dot model selection. We want to do a train test split so that we can actually evaluate the model. Um, and then we also want to say from sklearn dot ensemble, we want to import the random forest regressor. So here we're going to say scalar equals standard scalar. Maybe before that, we want to say that x and y is going to be equal to the limited data frame, um, everything except the price euro. So we're going to drop from the limited data frame the price, uh, price euros feature axis one, everything else is going to be x and y is just going to be from the limited data frame, only the price euros. And then want to say x train x test y train y test is equal to train test split x and y and the test size is 0. Point. Let's go with 1.5 because I don't think that we have too much data, do we? No, just 1300 rows. So let's just use 15% of the data for the evaluation. And the scalar is now now here as well. So let's go ahead and say that we want to say um, that we want to have the scaled data x train scaled being equal to scalar fit transforming uh, x train fit transform because we need to fit the scalar on the data and we need to then transform the data to get the scaled data. And for the x test scaled, we're now going to only transform because it's already uh, fitted onto uh, the training data. So scalar dot transform x test. There you go. And now what we're going to do is we're going to say forest equals random forest regressor. Um, you can provide you the end jobs argument to speed up the process. I don't think that this is necessary for that uh, amount of data, a data, but if you provide end jobs two, it's going to use two CPU cores and jobs four is going to use four CPU cores and end jobs negative one is going to use all the CPU cores that it can utilize. Um, and then we're going to say forest dot fit we want to fit on the scaled training data and the target data. And then uh, we want to evaluate this, we want to score this on x test scaled and y test. And we get a pretty decent score. So one is the maximum and 0 0.82 is a pretty decent score here. Um, and this is basically the evaluation of the model. So this model has uh, a pretty good accuracy. And we can actually also visualize that. So we can actually plot this to see what the results look like by saying that we want to have the prediction values by saying forest dot predict on the test data. And then we want to plot the predictions against the actual results. So we want to say PLT figure, let's say the figure size is going to be 12, eight, then we want to say PLT scatter, we want to scatter on the x axis, we want to have our predictions. And on the y axis, we want to have the actual results. And then we also want to say, uh, plot a line from let me first just scatter the points here, uh, plot a line from zero to, I don't know, 5000. And here maybe to 7000. 
So let's say PLT plot range 0, 5000, range 0, 6000, color being red. And then we should get, no, we don't. Oh, they need to have the same dimension. So let's go with 6000 and 6000. There you go. So you can see actually uh, the basic interpretation of this plot is that the closer these values are together, so the more accurate our model is, the more these values will be in a line. So if our model would predict the exact correct value every time, we would get all these points on the line. And if it's close to that, the points are going to be more close to the line. They're going to be closer to the line, whereas if the model produces complete garbage, it's going to be just noise. We're not going to see a linear pattern. So even though it's not exactly on the line, which is always hard for the regression task, um, we can still see that the points are pretty much close to the line. Maybe this one not so much, this seems to be an outlier. But all in all, it seems to be a pretty decent result here. Um, so that is that how would we now use this to actually make predictions on new data. So let's say you have a laptop, um, you come up with a laptop in your mind, or you see a laptop somewhere, a new laptop, and there isn't a price for the laptop. Um, how would you use that model that we just trained to predict um, to predict the price of this new laptop? This is actually quite simple. All you need to do is you need to look at the structure of a test instance. So we can go for example, to x test and then go with I lock zero. This is what we have here. Um, and you would have to provide the same information for your laptop. So what you want to do here is you want to create a pandas data frame or a pandas series, uh, just create a list and then turn it into a pandas series and set the respective column names. And you would have to provide the information uh, for that laptop. Does it have Windows 7 installed? No or yes, zero or one? Does it have Linux? Does it have no operating system? Is it from the brand MSI? Does it have an AMD CPU and so on and so forth? Uh, so forth. Um, how much uh, RAM does it have? What's the screen size and stuff like that? Provide all this information. And then what you do is you just say forest dot predict. And then in this case, also, you should go through the scalar first. So scalar dot transform. You want to transform this instance, let's go with, for example, x test, I lock um, zero, you want to transform this instance. And I think we need to pass this as a list. So like this, this would then re uh, produce this array here of scaled uh, features. So you could say x new scaled is that and then you could just say, forest dot predict x new scaled. And then you get the price uh, that the mall predicts for this particular laptop. Now let's see if that is close to the actual result. So as uh, y test, I lock zero, this is actually very close to the to the correct result. So this laptop costs 579 uh, euros, but we predicted 576. So this would already be uh, quite accurate. And this is data that the model has never seen before. The testing data was not used in the training. So it actually made a pretty decent prediction by just learning patterns. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting a like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.